author Cory Doctorow's politics are just heterodox enough to provide moments of delightful confirmation bias and squirm-inducing challenge for readers of nearly every ideological stripe. I spent my whole life in the political left of varying stripes, including very extreme political left. And I think I've heard people earnestly say politically correct it twice. Doctorow, a civil libertarian who identifies with the political left, has staked out a broad and eccentric beat for himself, covering topics from drones to digital rights management to open source software creation. I spoke with Doctorow about his latest novel, Walk Away. We began with a question about what happens when information becomes contraband. Do you think that sort of the underlying conditions of free speech as it is associated with dubious technologies, are mm. they getting better or worse? There is a pure free speech argument and there's a scientific argument that just says, you know, it's not science if it's, if it's not published. You have to let people who, who disagree with you and who dislike you read your work and find the dumb mistakes you've made and call you an idiot for having made them. Otherwise, you just end up kidding yourself and then, you know, your H-bomb blows up in your face, right? right. And, and atomic uh, knowledge was the first category of knowledge that scientists weren't allowed to freely talk about as opposed to like trade secrets, but like scientific knowledge that uh, knowing it was a crime. And so it's a kind of original sin of science, but there's a difference between uh, an atomic secret and the framework for keeping that a secret and uh, a secret about a vulnerability in a computer system. And, and they're often lumped together. So I was, at a, I was on a holiday, family holiday. We were at a, like a scuba resort in the Caribbean in a little island called Roatan in Honduras. And there was this family of DC area um, spooks uh, like multi-generational and grandpa w had been like with USAID when the tanks rolled on Hungary, he'd mm. been in Budapest and like all of the kids worked for um, undisclosed three letter agencies. And so we're like sitting in the, in the pool one day and talking about cyber weapons and cyber like you war. Do. Like on you vacation. do, on vacation. On vacation, that's what I do, I'm, I'm a, I, that's my idea of a good time. <laughs> so. The guy said like, well, what about cyber weapons? Like, can't, why shouldn't we develop cyber weapons? Why shouldn't we have cyber war? And I said, there's a difference between a secret bomb and a secret vulnerability in a computer operating system. Because if I invent the H-bomb, it may be unwise, uh, but keeping the physics of the H-bomb a secret do not, does not make Americans more vulnerable to atomic attack than disclosing it. Um, maybe it would help them at the margins build slightly better bomb shelters. But it's really, it's, it's, it's not the same thing as me discovering a vulnerability in Windows and saying it would be great if I could attack former Soviet bloc countries or countries in the Middle East or jihadis or drug runners by keeping this vulnerability a secret and assuming that nobody else discovers that vulnerability and uses it to attack the people I'm charged to protect. That mistake is, calls into question the whole scientific enterprise because we really only know one way to make computers secure and that's to publish what we think we know about why they're secure now and see what dumb mistakes our enemies and friends can locate and help us remediate. And so you end up in this place where these vulnerabilities that you are blithely assuming won't be independently rediscovered by your adversaries and exploited against you and yours end up getting exploited against you and yours. And not just by state actors, but by petty criminals too. And this is one thing we're learning after the Vault 7 leaks, is that a lot of those vulnerabilities were independently rediscovered and weaponized, not just by governments and by military contractors who serve them, but by like, you know, dum-dums who have crappy little identity theft rackets, right? I, you know, I, I guess maybe in, in the reason verse, it's a function of an imperfect market that the person who discovers the vulnerability that could be used by someone who could make millions with it ends up migrating to a dum-dum who makes hundreds with it. And if we had better markets for these vulnerabilities, maybe we'd have a more efficient marketplace. And maybe it would only be exploited by people seeking high value targets instead of t targets of opportunity where you're just looking for you know, scanning all of IPv4 for people who've got CCTVs 
Or maybe the highest process. bidder would typically be the person who actually wanted to close that vulnerability, at least in some cases. Well, except that would be a state, right? And like the states so far are bidding on these vulns just to exploit them. Like right. that would be great. And and this comes to this is the crux of the argument, right? Is that keeping security vulnerabilities a secret is itself a recipe for being exploited. It means that the only people, like a lot of contraband uh, dysfunctions. The only people who end up knowing that secret are people who are weaponizing it and not the people against whom it's being exploited until it becomes so widespread in its, its exploit that it can no longer be denied. So Mirai, the Internet of Things worm, now is very widely known because it was very widely exploited. And before mm -hmm. that, it was a, a cozy secret among dum-dums and creeps who used it for denial of service and, and blackmail. So um, this is particularly salient because we only know how to make one kind of computer, and that's the general purpose computer that can run all the programs. And we have computers that are now at the center of all of our policy problems because computers are at the center of all of our life, every element of our life. So in theory, we could maybe solve all of our automotive problems by changing which programs the computers and the cars can run. Don't let it run the program that runs over children, right? right? And in theory, we can fix maybe some of our um, uh, aviation security problems and we can fix some of our child pornography problems and like all the four horsemen of the infocalypse, the mafia, child porn, terrorism and, and uh, organ um, oh I always forget the fourth, mafia, child porn, terrorism and uh, not money laundering. Goodness me. I don't know, man. And and and, uh, and famine. Just throw a regular old bar. school. Yeah. yeah. Old school horseman. In right, there. right. Um, YouTube buffering, I'm sure. Yeah, probably yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, no, that's one of the 10 plagues of Passover, I think. Yeah, no, it is. It's YouTube right after buffering. the lice and before the death of the that's first right. one. That's right, yeah. So uh, um, this belief that we can solve our problems by making computers that are like correspond to a theory object that doesn't exist anywhere in theory, which is the computer that runs all the programs except for the one you don't like, involves necessarily a prohibition on disclosing defects in the design of that computer that might let you run the forbidden program. And that means that security vulnerabilities fester in those devices. And we have a perfect storm of terribleness in which the constellation of devices that we are designing to control what kinds of programs we can run is monotonically expanding. And the ways in which those devices can harm us is also monotonically expanding. And our ability to report security defects in those and continuously approve them is contracting. And this is catastrophic, right? And so like, I think that we can leave aside the philosophical argument about whether we should or shouldn't have free speech or what its limits are. And we can go to a purely utilitarian argument that just says, if you don't want bad firmware loads being over the air updated into your pacemaker, your car, the CCTV in your bedroom, and the toaster that could burn down your house, you know, we need to have a robust culture of, of investigation and discovery and disclosure of security defects in those products. And that is just not compatible with cyber war, digital rights management, crypto backdoors, anything else that requires controls on which programs computers can run. It almost sounds like something that's analogous to the problems with monocropping, right? Like there's there's this sort of one type of computer, it's everywhere, and we have now elaborate pesticides, and we have elaborate herbicides, and we have controls over who can plant what when, and who has the intellectual property on which seeds, but sort of on some fundamental level, the problem is just it's all this same kind of thing and therefore vulnerable to a single apocalyptic event. Is that fair or is that uh, overworking the analogy? I think it is a little because uh, although we don't know for sure what other computer architectures might exist, the only one that we've really been able to scale up and, and make good is this sort of Turing complete von Neumann machine. And there, there are some smart people at, at the Media Lab where, where I have a, an appointment uh, who think that maybe we could do other things, uh, but... Unlike, but, say, you know, corn, where we have already a thousand yeah, indigenous varieties that's we could right. be using instead. This is maybe more there like, really is just the one computer and we have yeah, to be well, cool Yeah, well, it's, it's kind of like maybe we just have one physics, and if only we had lots of different physics, then nuclear bombs wouldn't always work, yeah. right? And so if, if Turing completeness is like latent in the fabric of the universe, which seems to be this weird thing where like we try to design toy computing environments that just do a few things and they inevitably turn out to be bootstrappable into the full suite of Turing completeness. 
you know, like maybe that maybe it is there, right? Like Magic the Gathering is touring complete, right? And and like you you really know how to speak to our viewers. That's Corey. right. That's, that's right. You need uh, a well, big deck it, and a long time. But it is theoretically. But you can run Photoshop uh, on it. That's probably just true because we're actually all living in a simulation that was created to be uh, that. That's the condition they're testing here, right? Uh, <laughs> I um, I'm of the stripe of science fiction writer that thinks that all of those things are useful metaphors and um, dangerous assumptions about reality. What's the danger in making that assumption about reality? I mean, I don't actually have a strong view one way or the other on this question, but I am I am intrigued by your use of the word danger there. So it seems so. First of all, the arguments seem to me to have the the um, reek of uh, like collegiate mind game, logic games, right? Like I had a, a, a roommate and a dear friend, actually one of the people Walkaway is dedicated to, Eric Stewart, uh, who uh, died unexpectedly a few years ago uh, without any proximate cause, just didn't wake up one morning. But he was very clever. And in high school one day he sat down and he said, so the universe is uh, infinitely prolonged, right? It goes on forever. And I'm like, that's what am I understanding? And he said, we have finite lifespans. And I said, yeah. He said, anything finite divided by something infinite is zero. It's like, all right. And he said, therefore, the probability of us being alive at this moment is zero. I'm like, okay. And the only thing that is non-zero and divided by infinity is infinity. I'm like, eh? And he's like, therefore, we have infinitely prolonged lives and we are immortal. I'm like, can't argue with your reasoning, but I don't <laughs> think it's true. Uh, is it not fair to say, though, that you're maybe you're not your target demographic, but your de facto demographic is in fact like dudes who would like to have their mind blown by late night conversations in dorms. Is that an unfair Cory oh, Doctorow no. stereotype? And I'm all for having Those the are conversation. Your guys, right? I'm all for, no, 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 I'm all for having the conversation. But I think that uh, it's the difference between having a thought experiment and a religious faith, right? Fair enough. Thought experiments are cool and interesting. And like, I think science fiction has this great signature move, which is that it reaches into the world and it plucks a single technology out that is part of this complex matrix of technologies that are affecting our lives. And it imagines a world in a, in a bottle where that one technology is the central fact and where everything else, if it's present, is just garnish around the edges. And by magnifying it in this comic way, right, this, this caricature way, mm -hmm. It, it surfaces some of the latent emotional and you know moral questions around the technology that are otherwise kind of hard to tease out from the from the from that big matrix. It's like when the doctor goes and swabs your throat and then you know rubs it on a petri dish and leaves it for the weekend. What she looks at on Monday is not an accurate model of your body. It's a usefully inaccurate model of your body in which one thing is blown up as a diagnostic tool to let us understand it. You know, it's the physicist imagining the perfectly spherical cow on a frictionless surface of uniform density, right? Not because we have perfectly spherical cows or frictionless surfaces or uniform density, but that's a good first approximation for testing out your ideas against. And assuming that the cow is a sphere is a, uh, a useful and positive thing to do when you're writing science fiction and maybe slightly less so in Yeah, the eventually there's chewily weird reality. Right. I think in, in a lot of ways, this new book is, uh, I don't know, is it a prequel? Is it related in some way to Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom? Um, it seems like a similar universe. Has, has the sort of political takeaway that you would want people to get out of those two different books, has that shifted between them at all? Um, either hmm. because your views have changed or because kind of the facts on the ground have changed? So uh, I think that science fiction is not predictive in any meaningful way. And I think that like- It's certainly not great at it. Yeah, as a I mean, matter. I always say we're Texas marksmen. We fire the shotgun into the side of the barn and draw the target around the place where the pellets hit. We just ignore all of those science fiction stories that never came true. And yeah. But I, I also think that like, prediction is way overrated. I like what Dante did to the fortune tellers. You know, he put them in a pit of molten shit up to their nipples with their heads twisted around backwards, weeping into their own ass cracks for having pretended that the future was knowable, right? If the future is knowable, then it's inevitable. And if it's inevitable, why are we even bothering, right? Why get out of bed if the future is gonna happen no matter what we do, except I guess you're foreordained to, mm. right? So I'm not a fatalist, right? The reason I'm an activist is because I think that the future, at least in part, is up for grabs. I think that there are great forces that produce some outcomes that are deterministic or semi-deterministic, and I think that there are other elements 
that are up for grabs, and I think that the forces are the result of the elements that are up for grabs. That's you know the parts that we intervene in become unstoppable forces later that then we can damp through other mechanisms and other interventions. And so I think what science fiction does is not predictive, but sometimes diagnostic, because across all of the science fiction that has been written and is being written, and all the stuff that's being greenlit by editors or has been greenlit by editors, and all the stuff that readers can find and raise up or ignore, there's a kind of natural selection at work where the stuff that like resonates with our aspirations and fears about technology and our futures, that stuff gets buoyed up by market forces, by uh, the marketplace of ideas, and becomes a, a really excellent tool for knowing what's in the minds of the world. So the, the, the book itself, considered on its own, is a good way to know what's in the mind of the writer. The books that succeed tell you what's in the mind of the world. Mm -hmm. and, and if there's a lot of this stuff kind of coming to, uh, to, to uh, a prominence at this moment, I think it does say something about the moment that we live in, that, that there's a certain amount of pessimism. There's a fear that um, we are being stampeded towards uh, mutually distrustful, internally divided future where we end up um, attacking each other rather than pulling together. I think even the most cynical person understands that um, if civilization collapses and you run for the hills, that you aren't gonna be a part of rebuilding it, right? That the people who are the part of rebuilding it are the people who run to the middle and kind of get the power plant working again, reopen the hospital and get the water filtration plant uh, working again. And so, that mood of, of distrust and anger, of zero-sumness, zero although I just read an article this morning about how zero-sum doesn't mean zero-sum and that um, von Neumann, has this, who coined the term, had this very specialized definition that we all use wrong, but I couldn't figure out what it was supposed to mean because it was um, five in the morning and I'd only gotten five hours sleep. But, uh, but this notion that like my gain is your loss and that there's not enough to go around and there's this big game of musical chairs and the chairs are being removed at speed um, is, a, is a theme in a lot of the science fiction that's prominent right now. So Walk Away is in some ways a prequel to Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom. I certainly reread Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom with a pen and a highlighter and some post-its and made tons of notes before I started work on Walk Away and I have a whole file of, of themes that I wanted to pick up. Some of that is understanding that I've come to in you know, the 15 plus years since I wrote it. Uh, and some of it is um, wanting to respond back to the people who read Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom as a utopia and who didn't, who didn't understand that, the, that there were dystopic elements, that it was a very mixed future. And that reputation economics have the same winner take all problem that that Pikettian rate of growth is always less than the rate of return on, on capital problem that produces uh, you know insane runaway wealth disparity and dysfunction with like misallocation of resources literally because in, Amer in, in Down and Down the Magic Kingdom your ability to like run Disney World is based on how much esteem people hold you in and so literally you can walk in and start handing out tickets and if the people treat your tickets as though they're the right tickets, then uh, you get to be the czar of Disney World, right. which is the premise of the book. Mm -hmm. And so you get these crazy resource misallocations, get all these other problems, and that it's papered over with meritocracy, which I'm sure you know was coined as a satirical term to describe the delusion that the reason that you have so much and everyone else has so little is because you're better than them, right? And and yet, I'm sure you get all the time people coming up and saying to you, oh my God, you basically predicted Uber's reputational system. Yeah. Are you? And you know, and certainly while you weren't alone in thinking about those reputational mechanisms, and as you mentioned, Charlie Strauss has yeah. a bunch of great stuff in his books about, about how that might look. Um, well, and I stole it, it feels, from Slashdot Karma. <laughs> so it feels, it feels both normal and dystopian to people simultaneously. Well, but I think Uber is normal and dystopian for a lot of people too. Like I think all the dysfunctions of Uber reputation economics where uh, there's, it's one-sided, I can tank your business by giving you an unfair review, where you have this kind of weird 
like mannered kabuki in some Ubers where people are like super obsequious to try and get you to five star them and all of that other stuff. That is like, uh, I think that's actually characteristic of Down and Out the Magic Kingdom. I think I probably did predict Uber pretty well mm -hmm. with Down and what would happen if there were these reputation economies, which is that you would quickly have a have and a have not and, you would, and the haves would uh, be able to, in a very one-sided way, allocate reputation to have-nots uh, or take it away from them that uh, without redress, without rule of law, without uh, the ability to do any of the things we want currency to do. So it's like it's not a store of value, it's not a unit of exchange, it's not a measure of account. It's instead this like, it's, it's a pure system for allowing the powerful to exercise power over the powerless. And yet, isn't the sort of positive spin on that, well, yeah, but the way we used to do that allocation was just by punching each other in the face? Uh, well, that's one of the ways we used to. I was really informed by a book uh, by David Graeber called Debt the First 5,000 Years, where he points out that like the anthropological story that we all just used to punch each other in the face all the time doesn't really match evidence. That there's certainly some places where they punch each other in the face and there's other places where they just kind of got along. Including lots of places where they got along like through having long arguments or through like guilting each other or by you know doing lots of other things that were like varying still, degrees of functional. Still I'm feeling like the five stars on the Uber thing is better than the long arguments or the guilt. But maybe that's... Uh, maybe well that's, that's because you don't have to drive Uber for a living and you've never had to worry that tomorrow you wouldn't be able to. That's certainly true. Yeah. Uh, talk to me a little bit about um, the universe that that um, Walkaway exists in. And in particular, um, I'm interested in its sort of quasi-anarchic properties and the way sure. that, that sort of what exists of the law and then the people who are operating outside of it, how, how that, that interaction works. So the mainstream Walkaway world, what's called default, which is a term I stole from, from Burning Man, uh, the, the default world is one in which the rule of law is entirely tilted to the favor of a small cadre of super wealthy people who um, have kind of game, rigged the system. Uh, and um, everybody else, the 99%, either is in this very precarious position where some of them are needed to make the automated systems go and some of them are needed to make sure that the people who do the work uh, don't don't get too uppity because they can always be fired and then everyone else is kind of surplus to requirements and a lot of them walk away a lot of them um, become take an escape hatch into a kind of bohemian demi monde where they move into brownfield sites left behind by toxic post-industrial implosion they uh, use drones to find uh, the leftovers uh, of the civilization that had once been there and then they use software from the UN High Commission on Refugees to figure out how to recombine that to build a kind of fully automated luxury communist civilization where they just, um, you know, you go on a scavenger hunt, you find all the stuff and you build a huge Dr. Seussian amazing luxury hotel that anyone can stay in and that anyone can be the czar of and that anyone can, can kind of contribute to. And it's built sort of like a wiki where people add things and people remove things and you can see who added what and who removed what and you can decide kind of collectively through deliberation and sometimes through, you know, shitty arguments and sometimes through uh, very reasonable arguments. And one of the things that a lot of the walkaway culture aspires to is, uh, is the kind of rationalist mode of argument where we're talking things over rigorously trying to iron man each other's arguments is the best way to kind of win one over and decide what the best thing to do is and not just how to win. And it's pretty stable because it turns out the default doesn't mind having an escape hatch and you know, bohemias are cute, right? I mean, there's a reason that like loads of fast fashion places send their designers to Burning Man to make notes on what to knock off for the runway next year because bohemias are a cool thing to mine. It's, you know, grunge went from like, you know, Seattle's uh, underground, CD underground to like Sears in, in six months, right? And so Bohemians are cute, they're living labs. But then a group of scientists who've been working in default, figuring out the secrets of practical immortality for the super rich, decide that they don't really want to be complicit in helping the human race speciate into these like infinitely prolonged godlike humans and, you know, the rest of us who are just mayflies receding in their rearview mirror. So they, 
engage in a kind of Promethean act. They steal the secrets of immortality, which they, after all, discovered, bring them to the rest of us, and then the super rich realize that they're going to have to spend the rest of eternity with people they think of as being unworthy, and that triggers the Hellfire missiles and all out war. This is an analogy to open source software development. And mm -hmm. um, probably the phrase open source is one that people use incredibly widely without really understanding what it means. I mean, people use it to just mean vaguely collaborative or, um, right. you know, it sort of has a or very soft spooks meaning. spooks use it to mean just stuff in the newspaper. Right. Open source, is, it, has, it has a whole separate meaning, which mm -hmm. is just stuff people generally know. Mm -hmm. um, how much of your inspiration was directly from, I know you're a part of that community, you're, mm -hmm. you're, sort, of, um, you're sort of stuck in there quite deep, and how much of it is, um, again, just kind of a metaphor and let's not work too hard to make the parallel? So I, I actually, I'm, I'm working at whatever the thing that underpins free and open source software is, which I think is like Cosian coordination. So I think that like abundance is this triangle and up here is what we want, right? So Keynes, you know, wrote that paper in 1930. Our grandchildren will struggle to fill their three day work weeks because they will be able to produce all the things that humanity could reasonably want. And he grossly underestimated the elasticity of our demand. And now you have people like Mary Kondo making a cottage industry out of like convincing us that really all we want is like a single smooth river rock that reminds us of our mother, as Clarice gives us joy. says. It gives us joy. Us joy. Yeah, it makes yeah. us makes us feel joy. Um, and so like how much you want is obviously elastic, and it can go up and it can go down, right? And so that's one of the parameters on abundance that we have to think about. And then over here is like how much we can make, right? So 3D printing, automation, all of that stuff. And, and both of those have seen significant changes in the last couple of decades. Um, marketing, A-B splitting, um, uh, you know, new additive manufacturing tools, automated milling, robotics, all of those have been profound changes in our world. But all of the real action is over in this other corner, which is in um, logistics. And then that's like getting the stuff that people want to the people who want it after you've made it and figuring out how to remake it and figuring out what happens to it when we're done with it. So Bruce Sterling wrote this very influential on me essay in the mid 2000s called Shaping Things, uh, published by MIT Press, where he posits uh, an object called a spime. And a spime is a, is a, is a good, uh, um, an object that is immaterial, that exists as information until someone needs it and then it's manufactured but it's manufactured and designed in a way to gracefully decompose back into the material stream when its duty cycle is over. And it's manufactured in a way so that its use generates data about its efficacy and ways that it can be improved so that every time it's made, a new, it, it's better. And spines are a really provocative answer to the question of like how we can realize the Promethean project of both the, the heterodox right and the heterodox left, you know, the, the letting every peasant live like a lord, as opposed to insisting either on the left that every, that every lord should be made to live like a peasant, or on the right that um, lords and peasants are an inevitable fact of the world, and there'll always be lords and always be peasants, maybe we incentivize people by having that difference. The, way that we get every lord, peasant to live like a lord in a planet that only has one planet's worth of material is that we find better ways to connect the material that people need with the people who have it and where it is at any given moment. So that rather than like everybody having to own a car, we have cars that are services, but we also have completely... Um, uh, negotiable moment to moment things that you might need a car for and so when there aren't cars available the things that you can do instead of being in a car are sort of brought to the fore so like Google runs this data center in Belgium in a place where two-thirds of the time it's so cool that they don't need the air conditioning and the other third of the time they just turn it off and their file system is so good at migrating data away from places that are shutting down and into places where it's running that it doesn't really matter. You know, a lot of places that do aluminum smelting because it's so energy intensive, they use aluminum smelting as a kind of battery. They say, well, we need to smelt so many tons of aluminum this year. And when we have lots of solar or lots of wind or lots of tidal power, we don't have anything to use it for. So we smelt the, the aluminum then and not at the moment when other people are trying to turn on their lights or run their air conditioning or run their Google data centers. That kind of coordination 
where like at the moment that something is needed, it's and at the moment where it's cheap to do it, it's done, is characteristic of like efficient market hypothesis. It's characteristic of planned economy uh, theory. Um, it's the thing that everyone is kind of shooting for. And it's the thing that free and open source software has given us is the ability to coordinate ourselves very efficiently without having to put up with a lot of hierarchy to late bind why we're doing things or whether we're all on the same side, to be able to take things that we've done together where we've reached a breaking point and split them in two and have each of us pursue it in our own direction without having to pay too high a cost or even have a lot of acrimony. That's like, that's the, the free software world I'm trying to imagine. Like, what would it mean, be like to build skyscrapers the way we make encyclopedias in the 21st century? So you're over there imagining this world, but the place where the kind of social and political panic or preoccupation is happening is really, it's in that other corner of your triangle. It's in the logistics corner where we're, where the robots are gonna come and take away our jobs. That's the manufacturing corner. Right, sorry, the manufacturing yeah. corner. Where, you, where, where we're sort of, currently culturally perseverating is is over there. Sure. Um, you know, I think this idea that it turns out people don't want leisure on some kind of deep level um, is a thing that I'm particularly hearing on the right, right? The conservatives are are sort of doubling down on, you know, oh, actually there's there's value in work, there's value in difference, there's value in, in as you say, maybe those differences incentivize people. Um, and there's a sort of conservative version of the panic about the robots are taking our jobs. Then there's a liberal version of the panic about the robots are taking our jobs, which is what's gonna happen to the truck drivers, right? right. Um, when all of those are automated. But why is that the thing we're panicking about now? Well, because I think that we tend to worry a lot about the first order effects and the second and third order effects tend to come a little too late. Mm -hmm. uh, Gardner does well very famously said that the job of a science fiction writer shouldn't be to just think of the car and the movie theater and invent the drive-in, but also infer the sexual revolution. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I say to Gardner, once you've inferred the sexual revolution, maybe you could spare a moment to think that the sexual revolution happening in cars meant that um, for the first time, people had a reason to carry government-issued ID, which was to get laid, right? And that, like, the shibboleth of papers, please, which historically has been like a marker of totalitarian, you know, descent into totalitarian misery, um, became a, an everyday thing. And that today, a lot of the database nation is uh, the progeny of that strange moment where technology and social mores came together thanks to movie theaters and cars and the sexual revolution and gave us all driver's licenses, right? And so I think that science fiction writers do like to think past the first order effect of what would it mean if there weren't a lot of uh, truck driving jobs. I mean, is it fair to say that science fiction writers are doing the same thing as a good economist or a good political economist in thinking about unintended consequences? It's not just unintended consequences, because I think um, making all truck drivers into, you know, um, uh, desperate, um, xenophobic, uh, uh, populists who vote for, um, you know, who vote for strongman leaders was not the intended consequence of the self-driving car project, right? And yet that's the fear of that's, that's, that's what, that's what our, there's a fear that that's what our political moment reflects. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think that it's more like the job of a science fiction writer is to not even necessarily to map the territory, but to point out that there's territory to be mapped, right? Uh, there is a, a game we play when we argue about policy or tell stories, and the game is what's in the frame. So there's a famous science fiction story called The Cold Equations. I don't know if you know it. It's, mm -hmm. it's taught in engineering schools all the time. And it's, it's about a spaceship pilot who's piloting a small craft full of vaccine to a planet where there is a potential world-killing plague. And if he doesn't get the vaccine there, everybody on the planet will die. And there is a uh, young girl who's stowed away on his ship. And when he discovers her, he is aghast because he knows that the ship doesn't have any extra fuel. It has no autopilot. It can only land if he pilots it. If there's any excess weight, it'll crash. And without all of that, uh, everybody on the planet will die. And that's why he has to shove that girl out the, uh, out the airlock. And they spend 15 pages trying to figure out why they don't have to shove her out the airlock. And then he shoves her out the airlock. Just right? sounds like a sexier version of the trolley problem, right? It is. It, it's, it's just another sexy version of the trolley problem. And what's out of the frame here is that the author is like, 
the author set up the rules of this thought experiment, and the author decided that autopilots weren't a thing that reserve fuel wasn't a thing, that sending right. colonists with a supply of vaccine wasn't a thing, right? All of those, all that stuff is out of frame. So I think that science fiction is about pointing out in some ways that there are things that are out of the frame that don't properly belong out of the frame, whose, whose ruling out is arbitrary rather than, or customary, which is another way of saying the same thing. I, uh, when I saw the title of the book before I had even seen the illustration on the cover or anything, mm. I uh, immediately thought of the um, the ones who walk away from Omilas. Sure, uh, yeah. And and wondered if that was going to if this sort of this incredibly poetic kind of Ursula Le Guin scenario about you know when do you have to sort of fully disengage from society because it's based on an immoral premise. Um, I, I wondered if that would be what this book was going to be doing, and I think. In a, in a little bit of a way it is. Sure. Um, I think the was that connection on you at all? Uh, yeah, I think the connection is uh, that, so the book was originally called Utopia. Okay. And its thesis is that a utopian society, as we started saying, is one that fails gracefully, not necessarily one that works well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I sent it to Kim Stanley Robinson for a quote, and Stan read it and gave me a wonderful quote, and then said, and by the way, I don't understand why this book isn't called Walk Away. And I was like, you're totally right. And I asked my editor or my agent, they were like, Stan is totally right. And so we changed the title to Walk Away. But Stan might have been thinking of, of Le Guin's story. Mm -hmm. uh, last question, when you go to jail, what is it going to be for? Uh, what will the charge be or why will, they, why will they? I like that you asked that distinction and you may answer either way. Uh, so, you know, I have lots of different kinds of privilege that I think has kept me in reasonably out of harm's way, not just being like a white middle class articulate dude with half a million Twitter followers, but also like working at a civil liberties law firm filled with lawyers whose numbers I write on my arm before I cross borders, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, your answer can just be, I'm invincible, man. I'm no, never going I, to jail. No, you know what I worry about a lot, because I'm a, I'm a dirty foreigner, I'm a Canadian on a green card, and as we heard in the Supreme Court this week, it is virtually impossible to not have some way in which you are technically violating immigration rules when you are on a green card, crossing borders, whatever. Just the, you know, as the justices at the Supreme Court asked, like, if it says, list all your known aliases, if I forget a childhood nickname, does that mean that I've, I'm, I can be deported or jailed for, for immigration fraud? And the, the state's position was yes. That is, at any, regardless of whether or not the omission is material, the act of omission itself violates the statute and qualifies you. And given the highly arbitrary nature of borders and the very deep antipathy towards the people who cross them from many of the people whose job it is to inspect those people who cross them, that's the place where I have the most worry. I really do worry a lot about that because I cross the border all the time. And I worry that, like, I, I don't know what I would do if I were required to decrypt my devices. I have a certain amount of, like, purging I do before I cross borders to not, so to be able to decrypt my devices if, I, if I'm made to. But then, you know, there's this whole un, unknown area, which is like, what about making you log into your cloud services? And if you don't have the password, what about, calling the people who have the password and saying, Mr. Doctor o doesn't get out of immigration detention until you give us the password to his thing that he's left with you for safekeeping to change and then give to him so he can change it back when he gets out of immigration detention. Those are all things, those are like unknown unknowns, right? It's a, it's a complete black hole. I think by design, the government has not pursued cases where those questions have come up where it looks like the courts would find that they were uh, acting unconstitutionally because they want to see uh, that ambiguity flourishing because it, it, they have so much leverage over you when you're at the border that that ambiguity really works in your favor. I mean, after the Muslim ban, one of the things that immediately emerged when people said, what should you do if, was like, nobody knows. Mm -hmm. Nobody even knows for sure. So now I do ridiculous things. Like I have, um, there's a form, I think it's called the G28. So uh, border guards have discretion as to whether to allow your counsel to see you when you're in border detention. But that discretion goes away and becomes an obligation if this form has been signed and left with your lawyer before you cross the border. 
but it has to be on green paper. <laughs> and so I have signed many copies of this and left it in our paralegal's filing cabinet at EFF. Uh, and I always let a, a lawyer know before I cross and I always let them know when I'm on the other side and I hope that they look, check their phone and if they see that many hours have gone by and they haven't heard from me, they try and call me. And if they don't hear from me again, they go and they get one of these green forms. I bought a ream of green paper to print these green forms and they bring it down to the border to see if that's where I am. That's uh, maybe advice for all of our viewers here. I don't know. Yeah, get a, work get at a, a law firm. Work at a lawyer and retainer and yeah, a lot for, of green paper. Yeah, and a lot of green paper, ream of green paper. I have some leftovers. My kid drew on a lot of it, but I still have some leftovers. Thank you very much, Cory Doctorow, for Thank talking you. to us uh, about your new novel, Walk Away. My pleasure. For Reason, I'm Catherine Mengi-Ward. Mm -hmm.